Welcome, everybody. We're so excited that people from around the country are tuning in right now to our Google Hangout about how everyone around the country can support the Iran deal during these crucial times. Uh, we're, we're expecting the biggest war and peace vote of the year. Oh my God. The deal is so important and why your voice is absolutely crucial to ensure that we see the diplomacy is given a chance and that we take away the option for another war in the Middle East. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about um, why we are so excited to see this Iran deal um, and what, what it all means, what this Iran deal is about, and then and what the votes are about. Um, then my colleague Julia is going to talk about um, what you can do to get involved. And we're going to take questions at the end, so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, but we're just delighted that all of you are joining. Um, and I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Kate Gould, and I lead our Middle East Advocacy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And we are thrilled to be uh, partnering with all of you at this historic juncture. We see this is truly a defining moment in history where the US, Iran, and the international community have concluded an agreement that keeps Iran from the bomb and keeps the US from another war in the Middle East. And I should say, I mean, this deal certainly would not have been possible if it weren't for the work that people across the country with FCNL's network and the partners that we work with have been doing for years and years and years. FCNL has been working on this um, for more, over, the, over a decade, and we see that this is really the most important time to get involved. So first, a little bit about this deal. This is a deal that seals off all of Iran's pathways to the bomb. So it imposes the most um, intrusive inspections regime ever negotiated in history dramatically reducing Iran's nuclear program. And in conclusion, you know, we have uh, what President Obama called today the strongest nonproliferation agreement um, ever negotiated. So it is a, a feat, a masterpiece of diplomacy. It is about uh, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. It is about getting us one step closer to a world free of nuclear weapons. And it's about keeping the US from another war in the Middle East. Um, and really about transforming the U.S. approach to the world, to the Middle East particularly, um, and shifting it from this, this hyper-militaristic approach to looking at inclusive diplomatic solutions. And this is a, a model of, of that kind of solution. So this deal was reached on July 14th, um, 2015, so last month, and uh, already it has received wide acclaim. So we've seen that um, every country in the world that has spoken out about this, with the exception of, of one, and we'll talk about that later, uh, Israel, um, has supported this agreement. And more than um, you know, 100 ambassadors, former ambassadors serving under Republican and Democratic administrations have supported the deal. It's supported by people like uh, Madeleine Albright, by a host of national security officials, by the overwhelming majority of nuclear nonproliferation experts, um, and including by, by faith voices, by faith organizations, and a, and a wide range of peace and security groups that we work with. So it has um, wide support. It's supported by the majority of the American people, um, by the majority of Jewish Americans, by a number of Israeli security and nuclear experts. So it has, uh, you know, it, all these people are saying that we are far better off with this deal than without it. In fact, um, this deal is really making the world a much safer place to live in. Um, now, this deal was negotiated as a, as a multilateral agreement. So um, it, it took two years of, of intensive marathon negotiations to get to this deal. And while the deal has been concluded and endorsed by the UN Security Council unanimously, it now has to pass another test. So it's going to Congress, um, and Congress is going to vote on whether or not this agreement can go forward. So this agreement, it, um, you know, dramatically shrinks Iran's nuclear program, and in exchange, the U.S. has to lift sanctions, and the and other countries have to um, abide with those conditions as well. Well, 
that's going to, to work as long as Congress um, allows this deal to go forward. But Congress um, may sabotage this historic opportunity. All this work that everyone has put on, I know many of the people um, who are joining us tonight have been working on this for years and years, have been calling your members of Congress and um, been pushing the administration to pursue a peaceful solution. And we're finally at this historic moment and Congress could sabotage it all by rejecting the agreement. So the reason why we're, we're scheduling this time to talk with you now is because um, we see that in the coming weeks, Congress is going to vote on whether or not this deal goes forward. The Perhaps the biggest war and peace vote of the decade, the biggest war and peace vote since the vote to authorize the war in Iraq in 2002. And both the House and the Senate will vote. So all you know, every member of Congress will have an opportunity to weigh in on this issue, on whether or not the deal goes forward. And if Congress um, allows it to go forward, then we can see the deal pursue, the agreement um, proceed with preventing uh, Iran from a nuclear weapon and um, getting us in a path to, to solve this issue permanently, peacefully. Um, but if Congress rejects the agreement, then that actually strips the president's authority from um, fulfilling the U.S. obligations that it has to this agreement. So the it would stop the president from lifting the sanctions that the U.S. is required to lift under the deal. And if that happens, if the U.S. doesn't live up to inside of the bargain, then there's really you know very little chance that Iran will end up uh, live up to its end of the bargain. So that means the deal will likely completely fall apart, and then our countries are back on a path toward war. That's where we, we know how that goes. We've seen that before. The U.S. and Iran have teetered on the brink of war for years and years and years, and, and finally our diplomats have, have taken us off that path onto a peaceful path, and we want to make sure that's where we stay. So Congress is going to vote on this um, pretty much right after they come back from recess. So um, the day after, after Labor Day on September 8th, the Senate will begin debating this vote. The House is expected to follow suit um, soon after, and the um, Congress is expected in the first initial vote to reject the deal. Now, if that happens, that would... It's certainly unfortunate, um, but the deal can still survive because the president will save it. The president has already committed to veto any congressional rejection of the deal. So then after the president vetoes it, it would go back to Congress. Then there's the test. Then there's the make or break moment of whether or not two thirds of both houses, House and the Senate, will um, override the president's veto. For that to happen would be an absolute catastrophe that would show the world that the U.S. cannot live up to its diplomatic commitments. It's hardly worth negotiating with the U.S. And moreover, that the U.S. is just bent, that the U.S. Congress in particular is bent on just um, on regime change and isn't willing to just go along with Iran complying with its, its nuclear obligations. So um, we could see things escalate very quickly. So that's why we have to ensure that there is at least a very a minimum of a third of the House um, and or the Senate who are going to protect the president's veto, who are going to protect this deal, this the greatest diplomatic achievement. Um, and of our time and, uh, and make sure that it goes forward. So, no, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, this deal and the vote, we are expecting that it'll be close. And the opposition is pouring millions, multi-millions, you know, in, into um, opposing the deal, into multi-million ad campaigns in key states. Um, they are, they had a, a fly-in recently, they're putting in um, all kinds of media and local papers and they're trying to get, to turn on the heat for, for members of Congress to oppose the deal. The good news is the majority of Americans support this deal, including Jewish Americans. Um, they support it, but 
what we have to do is activate that support, ensure that there are going to be people, like I know the people on this call who are willing to pick up the phone, to call your member of Congress, to set up a lobby visit, especially over the August recess when you might be able to, to speak to them directly, um, and, and show that there is a true pro-diplomacy pro constituency that is going to support them in making the right choice, standing on the right side of history. So that's why we need all of you. I mean, this is really a test of you know, the millions, the multi-million dollar ad campaigns versus the masses, versus people, the overwhelming majority of Americans who do not want to see another war and who want to see us choose and, um, peaceful solutions who, to settle these problems without um, military strikes. So that's what this is, this is all about. That's what we want to talk with you about tonight. Um, we want to provide you with all the tools that you need to, to make the impact um, that only you can make. So here in, in Washington, you know, we hear members of Congress, yes, they have technical questions. They have questions about, about centrifuges and, 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 you know, enrichment of uranium and plutonium um, reactors and such. But they, what they tell us over and over again is that what they need to make the right choice to support this deal is to hear from constituents. I mean, I hear that from members of Congress and staff all the time, that what they really need is to know that there's support in their district. And they need to see that in calls. They need to see that in lobby visits. They need to see that um, in the email tallies. They, they need to see it across the board. They need to see it in their newspapers, that there is support for them to make the right choice. You don't need to be an expert on Iran at all. Um, and again, I mean, really, the implications of this are not about or just Iran or about the Middle East even. It's about how we change the way the US engages with the world. It's about war and peace. So. Um, on you know, your voice and the, the unique role that you have simply by being a voter, by being a constituent living in the districts and in the states uh, where these members of Congress um, are representing, by, you, know, you have that power and that's what Julia is gonna talk with you about, about how you, can, how you can use that power to ensure that we support diplomacy and move away from war. Great, thanks Katie. Um, so, hi, I'm Julia. I am the, um, I work in strategic advocacy. I am a second year program assistant as of this week. Um, and I uh, have helped set up in, over the past year hundreds of different lobby visits. Um, and so I just really um, wanted to talk to you all about all the different ways that you all can make a difference. Um, in terms of uh, advocacy. Um, so as Kate said, you know, you can write letters, you can send emails, you can set up visits um, and go lobby. And the truth is that uh, going on a lobby visit is going to make the biggest difference um, of, of all. Um, your body in person uh, counts for a lot in the eyes of members of Congress. Um, that means you're really truly passionate about an issue if you're going to take time out of your life and organize this visit and show up in their district offices that that's a huge deal um and you know there are also other opportunities to see them at town halls um which is a great opportunity because if you go to a town hall you're uh definitely going to be face to face with your member of congress so if you have the opportunity to ask a question and state your support of the ron deal that's a big deal, and that means you put a lot of work into it, and that gives us an opportunity, um, everyone in your state an opportunity to hear directly from your member on what they think. Um, so these are some great ideas, and I just wanted to um, talk people through a little bit of how to go about setting up a visit, because I know there are people on this call who have never done that before, which is awesome. I'm so excited that there are people in our network who care so much about this issue that they wanna learn how to uh, set up lobby visits uh, themselves for the first time. Um, and so, as you all may know, this is August recess, um, and that means that uh, at um, the, there are going to be members of Congress home all um, all month, basically, all the way up into the first week of September, um, and making visits and hosting town halls and doing all sorts of things. So that means your chance of seeing them in your own district office is much higher. 
So what I would do first thing tomorrow um, is call your district office. Um, and the best way to do that um, is, or the way, best way to find all that information, we actually have uh, a pretty easy way to do that, which is to go to fcnl.org slash Congress. Um, and I am going to screen share with you right now. Um, so you can, uh, you see this page, our online action center. Um, and let's say if you, like me, are from Kentucky, um, you can go to Kentucky and click go. Um, and here is my whole congressional delegation. It's a little small, um, but here, and so Mitch McConnell is one of my senators, um, and he's a pretty important dude. So I should definitely be giving him a call. Um, and what I can do is click on contact and I can see all of the information about the district offices that he has throughout the state. And I can call, um, in my case, the Louisville office is the best one for me to call. Um, so I can go ahead and call him there. And what you should ask um, is just, hey, uh, say, hey, hi, I'm calling because I would like to set up a visit with the senator during the next month um, about the uh, about the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and he the and then just say, what is the best way to go about this? Every office is going to be different and have a different system of setting up visits. They'll give you an email. Um, they'll send you on to somebody else in the office who can talk to you about scheduling. Um, or they might uh, tell you to call back at a different time or leave a voicemail. All of these, totally fine. Every They also might send you to an online form that you have to fill out. Um, and these are, and the easiest way to get a, um, an appointment right now is to basically follow their instructions at the office. So I uh, would go ahead and listen to whatever they say, um, especially if it's just sending an email um, or leaving a voicemail. Don't be intimidated if you don't hear back right away, but do make sure to follow up. Um, you know, a common parlance is that it takes about seven to ten pieces of contact uh, to get uh, a a lobby visit totally set up. So you might have to be sending a few emails back and forth with an office. You might have to be calling back a few times, especially because uh, members of Congress's uh, schedules are a little bit up in the air during August recess and there's a lot of stuff that's happening. So don't be intimidated by that. Just make sure that you um, uh, keep following up and stay consistent. Um, they might tell you that the senator or a congressman that you're trying to meet with is totally unavailable for that month. And if they say that, say, or they're not coming to your part of the state, maybe. Um, and if you say that, say, great, I would love to meet with uh, staff people instead, or my group would love to meet with staff people. And they'll give you the instructions for dealing with that. Um, so you, and you should also continue following up with them too. Cong members of Congress's office get hundreds of emails every day um, if you work in a congressional office. And so it's easy for things to get lost or think, um, for people to get behind on things. And that's not an insult to you or because they're ignoring you. Um, it's just part of the way it goes and they appreciate the follow up. Um, so yeah, and then um, if you can give them a set of dates that works best for you, maybe um, you know you have Mondays off or you uh, are retired and you know that you have several friends who can go on a Wednesday. Um, if you can give them a range of dates uh, that they can use, that'll be the most helpful. Um, but I would, I would make contact before you even have a definite date um, within your group set. So that way uh, you, all can, you all can work that out together. Um, keep in mind, probably these visits will happen during the daytime, um, during traditional work hours. Um, but that is A-OK, -okay, um, hopefully for you. If it's not, um, hopefully there's a town hall in the evening that you can go to, or you can do a drop-by visit um, on a Saturday that the office is open or do, um, or right after work and drop off stuff. Um, so yeah, so once you have 
establish contact and start getting a meeting together, you should get a group together. Um, you know, you definitely don't have to go at this alone and you uh, should spend an hour or so before the meeting planning out your visit, um, talking about who's going to say what, um, getting your materials together. You should use our um, Iran Lobby Leave Behind, um, which is on our, uh, I believe on our on this web page, yeah, um, is on the web page that you're on right now, fcnl.org slash Iran training, or if it's not, it will be, um, or at fcnl.org slash Iran. Um, and you should, uh, you, you should follow, uh, take this lead behind, plan out your visit and what everyone's going to say, and go in with a totally open mind um, and excited to talk about why diplomacy matters to you um and then you should tell us about it and you can talk to us the whole way through um we're so excited about these visits and we want to help in any way you can um and so if you at any point feel stuck um you should absolutely uh send questions to foreign policy at fcnl.org um which is a great site and which will uh or a, a great group of people who are reading that me included um and you can um and if someone in our office will be uh answering your questions and talking you through this if you're stuck at any point or you aren't hearing back or you just have some questions about the iran deal and what's happening and who's speaking out um so yeah then um, I'll talk a little bit more about what else you can do, but first Kate's going to talk a little bit about uh, what you should talk about, um, what kind of questions you should be asking your member of Congress, uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. Great. Yeah, thanks, Julia. As Julia said, we're so excited to hear about these lobby visits that are actually, you know, happening already. We've heard about many in the works, including lobby visits scheduled. Um, you know, there's some in Indiana and Colorado. Uh, let's see, Michigan, Maryland, Pennsylvania. We've heard about many of these going forward, some meeting requests in Oregon too. So um, it's it's so exciting just to hear about this. And, and as Julia said, it's, it's really like, this is the time to put in a meeting request because um, it can take a few weeks to, to get that all uh, squared away, especially if you wanna meet with a member directly, which is which is obviously the, the best um, way to go about it. So. Uh, as far as the questions to ask, so yeah, as Julia mentioned, I mean, the um, there'll be all the all the tools that you need, all the materials you need are on the web page that you're looking at right now or below our faces, um, and you'll see there's a leave behind that explains that shows what you need to take to congressional offices um, that Julia mentioned, and it has some basic talking points about the deal, and then also explains um, what our ask is, which is simply to please vote in support of this deal that guards against a nuclear armed Iran and another US war in the Middle East. That's what this is all about. And we want members of Congress to vote the right way, to vote in support of the deal. That's what you're asking them to do. And if possible to, uh, to come out as early as possible and to commit to voting that way, to say so publicly, to help encourage other members of Congress to also come out and build momentum, show that Congress is not going to sabotage the most historic opportunity in years to prevent a nuclear armed Iran peacefully. So that's what you're asking. And as far as, you know, um, the basics, I mean, I would stick with, with the basics. You know, we, we have lots of materials online um, at fcnl.org slash Iran, and we also have a Hill page, a page set up for Hill staffers um, at fcnl.org slash Iran facts. So there's lots of resources there. You know, there's things like the letter from more than um, 100 ambassadors supporting this deal and Israeli validators and um, national, U.S. national security experts supporting that that you can bring to their attention. But again, the most important thing to highlight is that you care about this deal, that you as a person who lives in Kentucky or Michigan or um, Oklahoma or wherever you live care about this agreement going forward. So that's what you want to stress um, in the meetings, and it's also what you want to stress at these town halls. And, and yeah, these town halls are incredible opportunities um, to, you know, if you get called on to ask your question, then you can simply ask um, your senator, representative, 
will you vote in support of this deal that guards against a nuclear armed Iran and another war in the Middle East? Um, and you can add more. You have time. We have, you know, uh, we have a, a whole town hall um, sheet. At, at, you go to the um, fcnl.org slash town halls. You'll see there's the FCNL calendar um, with town halls listed there and also uh, a flyer that you can bring that explains kind of the, the most important um, facts about going to a town hall and a sample question that you can ask there. I think that's, yeah. Great. So Julia, yeah, um, so the the rest of the things you can do, um, I mean, we totally are loving um, how many people are willing to go on visits, but we also understand that it's hard to set that up and it's hard to fit that into some people's schedules. Um, and so there's so much else you can do. Please keep calling and keep emailing. Um, we're not kidding when we say that members of Congress literally their offices tally the number of calls they get in favor and against and the number of emails they get in favor and against this and they're looking at that and weighing that as part of many other ways that they're weighing what support looks like in their district so we can't emphasize that enough uh, share our action alerts with all of your friends um, everyone in your meeting and then also uh, do other things write letters um, you, we, uh, as always, encourage um, meetings around the country and churches have letter writing parties and letter writing tables. Um, get, you know, when one Sunday, uh, get together and you can all um, write about why diplomacy matters to you personally and why this deal means so much to you um, as a as a Quaker, as an activist, um, and and you and so many other people can do that together. You can deliver these letters as a group to your member's district office, or you can mail them in. Um, and you can also drop by uh, the district office, even if you can't set up a visit, and take with you, you know, the, um, the Iran lobby ask sheet that Kate was talking about that just has the basic information about why, uh, why we're supporting this deal and also has case contact information on it um and so that if they have any questions they can get a hold of her and if, um and you know even if you can't uh set up a visit or stay for a whole visit even stopping by um that means something and that means a good deal um so yeah you should also um uh if you can't go to set up a meeting but you still are interested in going to town hall um, call the office and ask if they're having any town halls. We have um, a website, fcnl.org slash town halls, which has a calendar of town halls going on around the country, but they, uh, members of Congress, don't often announce those um, very far in advance um, and very publicly. So if you call and ask, though, their office might know a little bit more information and be willing to share it with you since you're a constituent and they want you to show up. Um, so call and ask and let us know if you hear about one because we'd love to share it with other people and get you a whole crowd um, of people who who are interested in um, coming with you and asking questions with you. Um, you uh, can also write letters to the editor. We know uh, there are lots of you out there who have been doing that, um, which is so great. Make sure to remember, mention your uh, senators directly in your letter say, hey, I really want um, for me, I'd say Senator Paul and Senator McConnell to vote in favor of this and send it around to your your uh, the newspapers in your state and see, hopefully you'll get published. Um, you know, they're looking for lots of viewpoints. Um, and so it does not hurt for lots of you to keep um, to keep editing or to keep writing. <laughs> um, yeah. And so as always, again, if you have any questions about this, you can uh, contact us at um, FCNL or at foreign policy at fcnl.org um, and ask us uh, questions about getting in contact. Um, so yeah, I know that we have some questions that have been sent to us. And also, if you have um, questions, uh, you can email them. Yes, great, <laughs> to Christine. <laughs> Okay, yeah. just holding up a sign. Um, so email them right now, and she'll 
uh, start giving them to us. But um, I, uh, let's see. And just and you can email them to Christine at fcnl.org just for people who aren't Uploading. reading it right now. There you go. Is that better? <laughs> Christine yeah. at fcnl.org. Um. So I'd say, what's a what's a question we can start with? Sorry. Um. Okay, uh, how about what are the major uh, points that critics of the Iran agreement are focusing on and what are the most effective rebuttals? Can you talk about that a little, Kate? Sure, I will. Um, I do, again, just want to repeat that you do not need to be an expert. And so if at any point they ask you tricky questions, uh, then you can you know, just say that you don't know and then you'll get back to, uh, to the member of Congress or the congressional office and we can give you more information. But um, to go into these answers. So uh, what are the major points critics of the Iran deal talk about? Okay, so um, I would say first thing you'll hear a lot about is that uh, the opponents say this is a short-term deal, that this deal, some, sometimes, you know, there's some version of this, that the deal only lasts 10 years or it only lasts 15 years or it only lasts 25 years and after that uh, then Iran has a permission slip to develop a nuclear weapon. That is utterly, entirely false. So this deal um, does not give Iran permission to develop a, a nuclear weapon. In fact, it prohibits Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. And the prohibition on Iran developing a nuclear weapon is permanent. That is part of um, the requirement uh, that is imposed on Iran as a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So one thing that this deal does in addition to um, the requirements that are already imposed on Iran with the NPT is that it requires that Iran ratify the additional protocol. So this is the name of an extra set of inspections that, um, that imposes these much, you know, enhanced verification and monitoring mechanisms um, so that there's much greater access by the um, UN weapons inspectors, the IAEA, to Iran's nuclear facilities and to suspicious sites than what we've had before. Um, and that kind of additional protocol or additional protocol around either the inspection regime, um, that's actually in place for perpetuity. It could be forever, as long as um, Iran is a signatory of the NPT. So, uh, you know, and I should say, I mean, this deal has different parts to it. So parts of it do last five years, parts of it last 10 years, parts of it last 20 years. Um, and there's these different timelines but um, overall, it's a comprehensive package to guard against a nuclear armed Iran. And, and the fact that there are limitations on certain provisions by years, well, that's just the nature of any kind of diplomatic agreement. Um, you gotta give Iran incentive that one day uh, they will you know, be um, part of the international community, that sanctions will be lifted, and, and, that, and this, this is, that's what diplomacy is all about. So, um, there are restrictions on Iran's civilian nuclear program, so uh, Iran's peaceful nuclear program that only lasts for a number of years, but the inspections to ensure that Iran never develops a bomb, that lasts in perpetuity. So that, that's one thing that often comes up. Another thing that comes up is that, well, this deal, um, by lifting sanctions, that means that Iran will have more money to wreak havoc in the Middle East to give to, you know, to terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, um, and that we will be, um, you know, and, and sending more money into Assad's regime in Syria. So I think the first, the most important point here is, look, yes, Iran is is supporting these the terrorism, these violent extremist groups um, in the Middle East, certainly along with along with other countries, and it's horrific what Iran is doing there, um, and that it's certainly better um, if, or you know, it's preferable if Iran does not also have a nuclear weapon in that kind of scenario when Iran is already um, supporting this violence in the region. Also, if we, you know, this deal really is about Iran's nuclear program. That's what the mandate is exclusively focused on. 
but it does um, provide new diplomatic channels for the U.S. to address these other issues, to address Iran's role in the region, to address Iran's human rights abuses, and these other matters that are very important to address the U.S. citizens who are being detained in Iran. Um, those are important matters, and they're not going to be solved with this nuclear deal, but certainly if we reject the nuclear deal, that makes all bets are off, you know, I mean, it makes things so much more difficult to negotiate on any of those other matters and make progress there. Um, a third issue that I'd bring up for opponents is that um, you hear that, uh, well, Iran, um, Iran is just evil. We can't trust Iran and they um, have, you know, lied to people in the past, they, you have these leaders who deny the Holocaust, you you have this very problematic regime and, um, or, you know, as an understatement, that you, you have this regime that is um, bent on Israel's destruction or bent on the U.S. destruction and that we just can't negotiate with these people. And so that, I mean, that's really, that challenges what uh, the whole narrative, the whole issue about whether we choose diplomacy or war, because what diplomacy is about is about um, finding peaceful solutions with traditional adversaries. It's about, uh, it's not about, you know, talking with your Facebook friends, right? It's about looking at how do we solve these problems in a constructive way, even with countries that we wholly disagree with on so many issues. Um, it's, it's, we, we need this agreement not because, uh, we, you know, because we, we trust Iran, but because we don't trust Iran, because we, we want to make sure, um, you know, in, entirely. I mean, we want to make sure it's, it, we don't want to see an agreement based on blind trust, and that's not what this is about. It's about verification. It's about ensuring that there are more eyes on the ground, more inspectors on the ground looking at, you know, tracing every ounce of uranium and ensuring that it's only used for civilian purposes. So I think those, those encompass a lot of the concerns, um, and I can go into others as people have questions. Is this deal a treaty? This is another question that came in. Uh, no, this is definitely not a treaty. It gets confusing, I know, because that's those are the main international agreements we hear about, but actually the vast majority of international agreements are not treaties. Um, so this is a multilateral agreement, and the reason why Congress votes on it at all is not because it's required in the Constitution like it is with treaties. It's because Congress passed a law. Uh, that said, you know, it's by statute that Congress has to vote on whether or not the U.S. can fulfill its obligations with this deal. And the next question. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Christine. I am your silent partner here at FCNL. Um, Julia, we'd like to pass it over to you. Yeah. Um, do you have any do's or don'ts for how to schedule a lobby visit? Um, and should I meet as an individual or in a small group? Um, so do's or don'ts. The first do is definitely uh, listen to whatever they tell you um, about how to contact them. But people don't really appreciate that. Um, we're getting a little feedback, I think. Um, oh, there it goes. Um, so, and then in terms of uh, other do's and don'ts about scheduling, um, just uh, keep consistent contact, um, like I've said so many times, but also um, be flexible um, and be, be open to different, different dates and different times. They'll be flexible, as flexible with you as they can, um, but you should also um, be flexible with them. Um, in terms of what was the question? Um, okay. um, and then, oh, do you have to lobby alone? Absolutely not. Um, you can lobby alone. You're definitely welcome to, um, but you should ask around and see if other people um, in your community can come with you, um, either before or after you choose a date and time of your visit. Um, if you are looking for people um, in, uh, in different, uh, in your area to lobby with, um, 
go first first suggestion is go to the meeting um find find friends or figures um or possibly even contact us we may know someone if you're nervous about uh lobbying alone we may know someone we can connect you to um to lobby with so you don't have to lobby alone but you're definitely absolutely welcome to um and small groups are equally equally well received, though some offices do put a lip size limit on groups. So you might want to watch out for making yours too big, um, which is a natural problem. Some people prefer no more than five or seven people go into an office at a time. So um, make sure to ask that if you're thinking about bringing a big group. And if you have more questions, you again, you can email Christine at fcnl.org. And I know many of you have email questions. We're looking through them now. Um. Okay. So another question that just came in, um, so about you know, please discuss the cons the consequences if Congress were to have a veto-proof majority to kill the deal. What would other countries do? I have heard some members of Congress mention third party sanctions threatening anyone who did business with Iran. Has anyone assessed that? Do opponents of the nuclear agreement have that or anything in mind as an alternative to the agreement? Okay, lots of good questions there. I'll try to be brief here. Um, so if Congress were to have a veto proof majority to kill the deal, what would other countries do? Well, the uh, other you know, members of the P5 plus one, um, so that's the permanent members of the UN Security Council, so um, Russian diplomats, Chinese diplomats, and Europeans, um, so including the UK, French, and, and German diplomats, were um, on the Hill yesterday. They met with about 30 senators, and they made it very clear to senators, and it sounds like it had a lot of impact from what we're hearing from, from staffers, that they made it very clear that there is no better deal. There is no other deal. I mean, this is the deal. And if Congress rejects this deal, then those partners that were absolutely crucial in getting this agreement are, you know, there's just not willingness for them to go back to the table and try something else. That um, this would signal that the U.S. is just not worth negotiating with. <laughs> um, it would signal that to Iran, and it would signal that to U.S. allies like the UK and France and you know other Europeans. Um, so it's it would be very dangerous, very damaging, and it would signal that the US just isn't serious about about diplomacy um, and and really cannot be trusted because it, you can't negotiate with the president, uh, the administration. Um, that it's you have to negotiate with 535 members of Congress. So uh, oh, what country? Okay, and that's ties into what countries have agreed to this agreement. Okay, so this agreement, you know, it's often talked about the U.S. and Iran, but this is really an international agreement. The world is behind this agreement. So um, the permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, so that includes the U.S., China, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, um, they're working as the, the European Union. All of those countries, along with Iran, of course, um, signed on to this deal, were parties to these negotiations. But in addition, as I mentioned, that the United Nations Security Council unanimously endorsed this agreement. So the world is really behind this agreement, and for Congress to reject it uh, would be rejecting international support. Um, back on, you know, what would what would other countries do, and what would the consequences be? Well, you know, third party sanctions threatening um, countries that have done business with Iran. Well, um, you know, what we've heard is that countries would do if, if this deal was sabotaged by the US Congress, then uh, that's not, and, and, and the Congress says, well, we want something better, we wanna uh, destroy every last remnant of Iran's nuclear facility. Well, that's not something that the international community is gonna sign on to. There's not support for that. The reason why they signed on to sanctions with, um, with the US is because they saw that this was a means to an end, this was about uh, pushing Iran to make concessions on their nuclear program. Now I should say, from FCNL standpoint, we have great concerns about, um, about those sanctions. We, uh, you know, we see that those sanctions have um, devastated civilian lives in Iran, and, and that's one of the great things about this agreement is that we, we're going to see a slow, gradual lifting of those sanctions, um, and civilians will win in Iran. 
But the consequences are, are very dire, and that's why all of these diplomats have been on the Hill and have been saying, you know, Congress, you have to support this agreement. That if if this deal falls apart, then Iran and, and the U.S. isn't going to follow through on its commitments. Iran isn't going to follow through on its commitments either. Um, then the negotiations fall apart, and we can see an unconstrained nuclear program in Iran. Tensions escalate, escalate, and we could see our countries back on a path toward mental confrontation, toward war. Um, now, it wouldn't may not happen tomorrow. It wouldn't happen, you know, it wouldn't happen in um, in months. It would, but it could happen. It could certainly happen in years that this, these tensions could escalate to that point. Um, Let's see, there's another question about well, what do I say if my member of Congress say, says that she's a supporter of Israel and so she hesitates to support this deal. I think it's important to say that um, certainly there is, you know, no quite, you know, it, it's easy to understand why people in, um, in Israel would be very concerned about Iran's behavior, um, Iran's Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism from, from various leaders. And that is why, all the more so, the, the reason why we want to see this deal go forward, because this deal is about preventing a nuclear armed Iran, preventing another nuclear armed nation in the Middle East. And so um, that would only make Israel safer. And that would only make the world safer, all of us safer, including Israel. So that's that's important to stress. And I would also stress that um, these voices of, of Israelis who have come out in support of the agreement. So, for example, people like Ephraim Halevi, the former head of the Mossad, kind of the Israeli equivalent of the CIA. He has come out in support of this agreement. He had a great interview on NPR, and, and he talked about um, how he he praised the that saying that the U.S. had a had a huge win by you know huge accomplishment um, in getting this deal. So there are people like that who are really looking at this from an, from a Israeli national security vantage point who want to see this deal go forward and know that um, we are far better off with this agreement than without it. Uh, I know there's some questions too about um, well, you know, how do we talk to those who say it's point it's pointless to negotiate with a country that vows to to wipe Israel off the map? Um, and I would say that um, in addition to what I what I just said is that uh, that we have seen diplomacy with Iran work already. So um, for the last year and a half. Iran has scrupulously adhered to the preliminary agreement, that what's often called the interim agreement. So um, this was an agreement reached in November 2013, and it froze Iran's nuclear program, rolled back some elements of it, froze the, the sanctions regime, um, provided the space for uh, diplomats to continue these negotiations to get to the final deal, and it was very successful. Um, it rolled back Iran's nuclear program for the first time in a decade. So we know this can work, and that's why we have to see it um, move forward. So let's see. For more questions, um, I know we're again Christine at fcnl.org if you have more questions, but. Um, there's another one about uh, last night the president met with major Jewish organizations in the U.S. Um, talked about how the opposition is planning to spend twenty to forty million dollars fighting the Iran deal. Um, can you talk about Jewish organizations in the U.S. that support the deal? Well, so we work with. Um, a number of Jewish groups who are in support of the agreement. There's J Street and Americans for Peace now. There's Jewish Voice for Peace. And again, I would say, you know, it's important to emphasize that the vast majority um, of, so we see, you know, the majority of Americans and um, the majority of Jewish Americans support this agreement. Uh, there's just been a poll released by J Street showing that support for the agreement is even higher among Jewish Americans than it is in the general public. So those are, those are important points to, um, to push back on. And a validator list. So somebody asked about um, where can where can they find it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so there's if you go to our um, website fcnl.org/slash/iranfacts, 
you will see a number of validator resources, um, US national security experts, and, and there's also a list, um, it's actually from, we just linked to a list that Americans for Peace Now is keeping of Israeli validators, um, Israeli security and national um, and uh, nuclear experts who are supportive of the agreement. So what do you say to say, well, you can't trust Iran to keep their end of the bargain? Um, you know, again, I'd say, well, this agreement is not based on blind trust. This agreement is based on verification. It's about ensuring that inspectors are in there, that um, there's 24-7 access uh, to Iran's key nuclear facilities and that um, Iran's, you know, that, that these inspectors can go uh, where they need to go, when they need to go, um, to ensure that Iran is upholding its end of the bargain. Um, yeah, so I know there were some questions, this, this often comes up, oh, okay, about, um, so while the Iran deal allows for frequent visits to declared sites, there's as much, uh, there's some concern about the 24 hour, the potential 24 hour delay for um, for suspicious days. sites like military facilities. So, 24 day. Sorry, 24 day. 24 day. Um, so, okay, it's important to note there that um, inspectors have the access that they need to ensure that Iran's nuclear program is exclusively used for peaceful purposes. And they, they have that because they have that both through the inspections of, of the key nuclear sites, um, but also because they, uh, they have, there's a separate program where um, when they have concerns about another site, about a suspicious site, then, uh, there's, then they, um, the inspectors can ask for access and uh, there can be as much, uh, as much delay as you know, 24 days. That's the maximum. Um, it, it often takes you know, 24 hours to get into these suspicious sites, but it can be delayed as much as 24 days. Now, when the nuclear inspectors actually go in, then they have this equipment that shows um, any you know remnants of nuclear material that has and and that uh, shows up years after any nuclear material was used in in such a site. So this isn't something you know as President Obama said today in his speech. Um, it isn't something you can hide in the closet. It's not something that you can just uh, you know like. Uh, push out and 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 think that you're not going to get caught. Um, and in fact, the other thing to keep in mind is that when these um, when there's any suspicion about Iran's uh, military sites, then that means um, that there's going to be surveillance of those sites. That that if there's any activity of Iran, if they look like they're trying to clean out the sites, they're going to know about it. But again, I mean, they're they're using um, equipment that can pick up traces of nuclear material uh, that over years and years and years and years. So it's not something that they can just um, shove away. Let's see. So what do we do about, um, about members of Congress who are raving against the agreement um, using false reasoning. I mean, I think, you know, one helpful kind of one liner is simply, well, aren't we better off with the deal than without it? And whatever, if, and if you don't think this is the perfect deal, and we think, of course, this is an extraordinary agreement, but um, if even if this deal doesn't have everything you want, aren't we better off with inspectors on the ground um, than without them? So that would be my. My one sentence answer. Um, so let's see. There's there's other people who say there's uh, somebody received a letter from a congressman who said um, that they signed a letter to Kerry expressing concern over Iran's refusal to comply with nuclear inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Okay, so on that front, um, well, I mean, first I would say that's. All the more reason why we want to why it's important to support this deal going forward because this deal would ensure greater access for the IAEA um, and about concerns about you know IAEA access. Well, uh, there are concerns about that, and there's actually a separate process, a separate negotiating process with the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, to ensure that they have all that you know um, the the answers they need about Iran's past 
um, you know, possible military dimensions of its of its nuclear program. So that's about Iran's past. Uh, but this agreement that is already um, concluded, that's this agreement is about Iran's future. It's about whether Iran uh, will move toward a nuclear weapon in the future. And with this deal, that stops that from going forward. It seals off Iran's pathways to a bomb. Um, and there's a question about uh, some congressional leaders say the side deal with the International Nuclear Agency isn't open to Congress, and so that's a big problem. So that's um, that's just how these agreements work with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and and that's important that they're that they're confidential because that's. Um, ensures that they can get the, the answers that they need, which are often going to be um, confidential. But these, look, I mean, this, um, we already know uh, a lot about Iran's uh, nuclear program, and um, the, we already know, and, and according to the U.S. intelligence agencies, they've concluded that Iran did have a nuclear weapons program um, up to 2003, and then they, they halted it. And so that, that's what the assessment is from the, international, from the um, U.S. intelligence community. There are, there are experts that have disputed that, but um, I would say that you know, there are important questions, and that's what, that's what this whole IAEA-Iran agreement is about. But that's about Iran's past. What's most important is about whether or not we get this agreement um, for Iran's future, for uh, to ensure that in the future Iran does not develop a nuclear weapon. And that's open for the public. Everybody can read the agreement. Um, you know, it's it's online. It's and uh, that's available for all members of Congress. So I'm just going to pass it back to Julia to close us off. Oh. Great. Uh, thanks, Kate. Those were great answers um, to so many uh, questions about this pretty complicated deal. But I uh, just wanted to close off by emphasizing again that um, really the the only expertise you need is the expertise on why you personally believe that this is a great deal. And um, you as a constituent have a valuable voice to this member of Congress. And even if there are TV ads playing about this um, against the deal, you know, even if you feel like that's totally, totally dominating the conversation, um, that, that doesn't actually make as big a difference um, as hundreds of constituents uh, talking to them genuinely about their real support. Um, you know, that may, that may feel um, like a big thing, but I, I would advise you to not be intimidated by that. Um, it's, way, it's way more important um, for you to be communicating why instead of why you find this so important um, and let that let that motivate you into these offices instead of scaring you off or um, making you feel like you uh, should back down we obviously we have tons of resources to help support you um, do this at fcnl.org slash iran and fcnl.org slash iran facts and fcnl.org slash congress um, and yeah, please send questions our way. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. This has been um, really great and we're so excited to see where this takes us, so. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.